the peregrine falcon, the fastest animal in the world, with a speed of over 200 miles per hour. Some might call it the paragon of animals, a courageous and formidable hunter, able to catch much larger fowl than itself. As a symbol, it dates back to the ancient Egyptians, with the sun god Ra depicted with the head of the peregrine falcon. It's also the crest or cognizance of Shakespeare's coat of arms, answering the question, who is shaking the spear? Hello and welcome to the Speedy Dispatcher part four, the fourth and final part of this series. My name is Glenn Alexander and thank you for watching this video and this series. If you haven't already seen part one, part two or part three, please do go and watch those beforehand as this is a continuation. It all builds on from the previous part. Now, in this episode, we're going to look at the third part or book of this collection of falconry. Before I deal with diseases of hawks and cures due to the same, which is the subject of this third and later part of my collection of falconry. So this part of the book is all to do with diseases and cures, diseases such as when your hawk standeth, melancholy, the mischief of the liver, naughty humours and fever. Now, where's the best place to minister this medicine? But... Westminster Abbey, where there's plenty of ministers. We started to look at these windows in the last episode, and you'll notice the marble fronting there with our coats of arms. Now, if you have a look behind this marble fronting, you'll find this wonderful thing, which is a beautiful golden rose. And this is the rose that is given for you in the second line of sonnet number one. From fairest creatures we desire increase that thereby beauty's rose, it's even italicised for you, might never die. And that is a beautiful rose that is never going to die. You also find quite a few other rose references in the sonnets. Bright eyes, lights, flame, world's fresh ornaments, own bud, we have a look at sonnet three. Look in thy glass, thou art thy mother's glass, so thou through windows of thine age shalt see. So you can see these references are all there for you. If we also have a look in the centre of the rose, you can see that there is a bird. This, as shows you in the Minerva Britanna, is the bird of Jove. The positioning gives it away for us, sun above, earth below, just as in the rose. And we can be doubly sure because underneath that eagle, we have some square lightning bolts. Just as in another emblem, we have Zeus, Jove, with his square lightning bolts. We can be pretty sure that is the bird of Jove. The bird of Jove was, of course, an eagle, a bird of prey, as also referenced in the Book of Falconry. So we have a bird of prey in the centre of that golden rose. I also really love this emblem because it's terminus, this pillar. The upper part was like a woman framed, just like glass. Of marble hard, a pillar was the rest. Also on this window, to the left beneath the blue shield, we have an almond. Now that's interesting because within the third part of the Book of Falconry, almonds seem to be recommended as a cure for quite a few diseases. Oil of almonds, oil of almonds, oil of sweet almonds, oil of sweet with an E on the end almonds, steeped in oil of sweet almonds, oil of bitter almonds, vinegar or rather the juice of an almond which is much better of the bigness of an almond oil of them, then heat them again as before to press out as much oil of them as possible and put it up in a glass. Take a little long iron round at the end as a piece and oil of sweet almonds. Or for lack of that, oil of roses. Indeed, we have a rose there. Oil of roses, roses dried, rose water, sweet rose water, syrup of roses, rosemary rosemary dried, now and then with the water of fennel and of roses, 
glue it with the semen of Rosen, whatever that is, and to make new flesh grow up again, put to it a little honey of roses. Ye may return again to your oil of almonds or oil of olive till your hawk be thoroughly recured. Let's throw in a flood of loose for good measure, or a, uh, a stately gate, a gate or else for want of that, in woman's milk, and let it be done in a good large glass well covered. Water, and afterwards letting it soak in rose hyphen water, a space, and lastly by putting unto it of the best sugar that I could get, or sugar candy beaten to a powder. So these are strange medicines, but our Italian falconer does tell us a matter not long to be stood upon. I will refer you over to the Italian authors as touching the diseases, cures, whose judgment I do very well allow and in many points prefer beyond the French falconers for that they seem to be the more reasonable men and less given to frivolous inventions. Here are sundry receipts and medicines which I have never proved and therefore I can warrant little of them, but nevertheless I find them. These two cures I never tried because it was never my hap, I thank fortune, to stand needful of the practice, but truly I like neither of them so well as I can greatly commend them. But these practices and devices I did never approve and therefore do commit them to the discretion of the reader. These are strange remedies and rare, and of the French device, give your judgment of them and by trial you shall know what they will do. I find them in my author and therefore do set them down and not for any experience I have had of them. This art of falconry craving you to judge the best both of them and me, of them your neighbours for the first inventions, and me your countryman for my late collection, whose pains bestowed herein shall be nothing but a pleasure if I may find myself girdened with good liking and deserved thanks from you. And so I commit you over to the discourse itself without any further circumstance or protestation." basically boils down to, as he says, make therefore as strong lie as ye can. There's also another error, you can see it here, 301, then you get 392, and then page 303, so there's another page fault. And here we have this recommendation for a cure, take the gall of an ox, or of a bull, which is better than an ox, and all to beat it and break it in a dish, anoint the horn of your hawk's clap or beak therewith, and the very place where the formica grows to keep her from vermin and mites. I'm not sure I can get the gall of the ox on the NHS, but then again, I'm not a falcon. Now, if we look at our princely falcon gentle, it seems that one of its feet is disproportionately larger than the other. Now, this is because it's suffering from a swollen foot. It happeneth diverse times that hawks have a swelling in their feet that cometh by chasing of their feet in fleeing their prey and in striking it and by taking cold upon it. They behefal of gross humours and foul within, which humours being removed by their labour and travel in fleeing, drop down upon their feet. So their humours are, the gross humours are dropping down to their feet. Furthermore, to preserve hawks from mischiefs, for diverse times, when hawks have beaten and bruised themselves at the encounter with great toil in the field or at the river, they be so tired and take cold so lightly and do so chase their feet that if you should set them down in that plight upon a stand of stone or wood, their legs and feet would swell by reason of the humours that would fall down and distill from higher parts and by that mean breed gouts, as happeneth in men by like disorder. For such diseases light not to men, but for want of good heed and looking. And we're looking and we can see that foot is most definitely swollen of the swelling in a hawk's foot, which we team the pin or pin gout. Remember, this is brass, and from Richard II, Act 3, Scene 2, brass impregnable and humoured thus, comes at last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall.
and farewell, King. We also have this. To know whether your hawk have the ago, mark whether her feet be more swollen than they were wont to be, or no, if they be, then she hath the ago. Seeing that I have begun to write and decipher you the mischiefs that do happen to hawk's feet. So you can really see there is a difference in size of those two feet. A very telling disease. To help our sick falcon recover after she's had her medicine, we need to keep her warm. And you remember there is a fire there and some windows letting the light in. And as it tells us multiple times, warming them at the fire and the sun, fire and the sun, fire and the sun, fire and the sun. And these are just a few of the many references, then setting them all the while by a fire or in the sun till they have cast the slimy and gross humours. At the end of the Book of Falconry, we have our Treatise for Spaniels, which also has some diseases and cures. I'm only going to go through this one. A very strong me. You can see it's hyphened medicine, but it's hyphened on me. So a very strong me. Let's have a look at the cure. Take Quicksilver of Quicksilver. And you'll remember I've been showing you this a number of times that swift as Quicksilver, it courses through from Hamlet Act 1, Scene 5. And in the elements on page 174 or 174, we have this. Red Ed Smith's concerning ermine, for said he, seeing colours are resembled to planets. Ermine ought to be Hermoys or Hermes for quicksilver, being so appropriated to Mercury as it bears his very name of breaks into drops resembling ermine in armories. But we that are no scholars must not, least we should come rationi in scenere, uh, which means uh, come rationi in scenere mad with reason, we should not be mad with reason, soar so high into learning for a thing before our eyes and palpable. So we shouldn't go mad with reason, but use our eyes. Jared Lee holds that ermine is a little beast in the land of harmony, so he sounds it and is from thence denominated to ermine, should according to him be Armin of Armenia, certainly. Uh, you'll see the ver in the side notes there, the ermine, as ermine is plainly a word of another root. It is a word that provides another root. This is what ermine looks like. It's a fur from this stoat, or little beast, as Gerard Lee calls him, uh, which is white with its black tails. Now, Gerard Lee is, of course, a reference to this book, The Ascendants of Armoury. And later in this book, you have this page, this wonderful page, with a description following, saying the Hirhort, the herald that you see here in a chemise blanc, white, powdered and spotted with mullet, sable, black, which of the old Hirhorts is termed Gerard Lee. That's funny because the author of The Ascendants is Gerard Lee, the two characters having a dialogue through the book are Gerard and Lee, and this herald is wearing Gerard Lee. Now, if we have a look and use our eyes at what he is wearing, then you'll see it's not just the mullets, the stars that are on his chemise, but we have our ermine. And you remember, ermine is our quicksilver. So he is wearing quicksilver in a sense, and Quicksilver, a very strong me. Now we're going to have a look at this shield shortly, but you'll notice the ermine on the shield. And you can see across his chest, he is shielded with one scooch on shield of England, first born by the Queen's ancestor, Holy King Edward and Confessor. So we have the arms of Edward the Confessor yet again across his heart. Now what is this herald pointing to but the panther and this panther is very similar to our greyhounds it looks very similar to our greyhounds and what is holding up this flag but our dragon and we met a dragon in the elements of armories one authentic author to declare the Assyrians bear 
a dragon. So again, our poetic aberration, not saying the thing directly, but something similar to it. To stand to uphold the banner, says in the Ascedents. And that was page 40 in the Elements of Armouries, which will be uh, significant in a second. Now, if we have a look at what it says uh, on this one page, the Heerhort starts off, Mo clothes were better for winter season. You'll notice the win and mature seem to be a little disjointed there, winter season. When the dragon replies, the law alloweth must needs be reason. And at the bottom, the Heerhort responds, a Heerhort in hast haste must thus be clad until such time as Mo clothes be had. So this page really does have all of the elements of this game on it, and it's really beautiful. If this is a page to serve his wit, I think this would be it. More clothes were better for winter season. Clothes, of course, referring to our coats of arms. And on the scroll beneath the Greyhound, we have he wins with the law of arms. He wins with the law of arms. So if we have a look at sonnet two now, when forty winters shall besiege thy brow, youth's proud livery, remember livery of his clothes, shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession, this is the ascendance of armoury, thine, this were to be made new when thou art old and see thy blood warm, when thou feelst it cold. And remember, he's wearing clothes for winter season because more clothes to keep him warm during winter. So this were to be made new when thou art old and see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. Now, you remember this coat of arms with our ermine, our quicksilver, me, in other words, on the front of this armed. And if we sum, if you think that an X in Roman numerals is a 10, you'll notice this, 10, 20, 30, and on the window itself, you have your final X, 40. So there's your 40, 10, 20, 30, 40, made by the coats of arms themselves, which I think is just utterly remarkable. And you'll also remember that the dragon was on page 40 of the elements of armories. Just unbelievable. It's lovely. And there's many reasons why 40 is also associated with Edward de Vere, from Vere meaning four in German to T meaning mark. So it's the mark of Vere. Ea, the god of wisdom and mischief, is represented by the number 40 to his life dates themselves. Now, to make a falcon bold and venturous, I recommend a pep talk to the art, profession and knowledge of luring and manning those birds of prey by which singular skill they are made to flee all other fowls as well those fowls of air as to the land and river, which in my conceit deserveth no slender commendation and praise, being a matter almost quite against the laws of nature and kind for one fowl so artificially to undertake and so cruelly to murder. Just notice that word there, murder. Another, and having achieved his enterprise with greedy and willing minds, repair to man again, having the whole scope of the heavens and the circuit of the earth at their pleasure to range and peruse. To return to our funerary monument in Stratford-upon-Avon and Act 1, Scene 5 of Hamlet, like quills or feathers upon the fretful porpentine, but this eternal blazon, blazon, a description of arms, must not be. To ears of flesh and blood, lift, Hamlet, O oh lift, if thou didst ever thy dear father love, O oh heaven, revenge this fowl, remember fowl is a bird, and most unnatural murder, Hamlet, murder, murder most foul as in the best it is but this most foul strange and unnatural haste haste me to know it you remember your haste from your hearhort that with wings as swift and remember that swift as quicksilver it courses through and from our blazon of our draft grant of arms 
we know that the wings of this falcon are argent, silver, as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. So, let's take some revenge. How to make your falcon kill her fowl at the first. This is the monument to Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon, just outside of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Around the bottom, you have a quote from the Tempest. Oh wonder how many goodly creatures are there here, how beauteous mankind is, oh brave new world that has such people in it. And from our first sonnet, from fairest creatures, we desire increase that thereby beauty's rose might never die. Also from the Tempest, a noise of hunters heard enter diverse spirits and shape of dogs and hounds hunting them about, Prospero and Ariel setting them on, Prospero, hay, mountain hay, Ariel, Ariel means of the air, silver, there it goes, silver, Prospero, fury, fury, there tyrant, there, hark, hark. Here's a close-up of Shakespeare's face, you'll notice he looks very concerned, I wonder what he's looking at. The Falcon. Now hopefully the Earl of Oxford's poem to the reader makes a little bit more sense. The labouring man that tills the fertile soil and reaps the harvest fruit hath not indeed the gain but pain, window pain, and if for all his toil he gets the straw, pretty sure oxen like straw, the Lord will have his seed, the swiftest hare, the greyhound, such speedy haste away, the pain to pen the book of goodly golden muse, for he that beats the bush the bird not gets, but who sits still and holdeth fast the nets, the paragon of animals, the peregrine falcon. The epilogue unto the reader from our book of falconry. Lo, reader, hear the end of this my book, though not the end of my good will and love. Bestow thy pains whereon a while to look. I count my toil, toiler, and travail, but a game. I deem the days not long or spent amiss. If so, I may unto thy fancy frame. Some men perhaps will wonder what I wrote of stately hawks and birds of rare delight, and blazed it out but in so base a note. A jest it were, and sign of slender wit. Just remind you of this, so oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit. A jest it were, and sign of slender wit. The writers ought the reader's vein to hit. And of course there is our wit writ in brass. This was the cause I wrote, my book, e on the end, so plain, I told it erst, I tell it now, again. Falconers, farewell, at pleasure do peruse, these leaves and lines, each picture and each page. Readers, advise, I have no further news, I can but with you ancient nesters, the first line of the uh, epitaph, Judico Pilium and Nestor in judgment, Nestor was known for his wisdom, and below our falcon in wisdom hast thou made them all. I can but wish you ancient Nestor's age, unto whose dooms my writing here I gauge, to cure your hawk or make, remember make is poem, poetry, your cunning more, if aught be here I clap my hands and therefore my muse, and I have done the best we can to learn you how your hawks to lure and man. The crown that ends the work. You cannot do a better deed than thank the painful man. So there we go. Who is shaking the spear? Hopefully you now know. And as Hamlet says, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. But behold it, to see the excellency of art, what it is able by cunning to achieve, which truly doth appear in nothing more than in hawking. And you have this wonderful book on hawking that I'd suggest that you read if you'd like to know more about the excellency in this art. Why, how now, Uncle Gloucester? Talking of hawking, nothing else, my lord. 
is our Italian gentleman, and here's what he really looks like. This is his Titian portrait, this Italian Earl, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, a souvenir from his year spent travelling around in Italy. There's actually a falcon hidden in the lines behind him very craftily, and I'll talk more about this portrait later this year. Lastly, this is Edward de Vere's final coat of arms. It has 21 coats, and like our minds, we are commonly dressed. So there's Edward de Vere, but most importantly, above these two crowns, you can see in a what seems to be a flaming crown, this wonderful bird of prey, the crest or cognizance of his final coat of arms. Thank you very much. Minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have lift off of the Falcon Nine. Stage one. Pitch kick. Falcon Nine has cleared the tower. Stage engines and tanks. Looking good. Getting gravity turned. 